What are your prime directives? Serve the public trust, protect the innocent, uphold the law. All Detroit has a cancer. The cancer is crime. Hi. Uh, Murphy transferring in from Metro South. This guy's gonna be your new partner. Murphy, meet Lewis. Show him the neighborhood. Glad to know you, Murphy. Central, this is Unit 154. We located that van by the old mill in Sector 3D. Now, where's that backup? Don't move. Dead or alive, you're coming with me. Well, what have we here? You a good cop? Hot shot? <laughs> get the best of both worlds. The fastest reflexes modern technology has to offer onboard computer-assisted memory and a lifetime of on-the-street law enforcement programming. It is my great pleasure to present to you Robocop. Quietly, or there will be trouble. Drop it! In 1987, Robocop hit the big screen. Produced on a modest budget of $13 million, it grossed $53 million in the United States alone, making it a great success considering its R rating. It was highly praised by critics for its great use of satire, violence and slick direction. A year later, due to the film's popularity, they released an animated series produced by Marvel Productions, which consisted of 12 episodes and a line of toys in traditional 80s fashion, aiming an adult movie at kids. I did have the Robocop action figure, but I was always disappointed by the lousy gun they gave him. During the 90s, Robocop came to Laserdisc and DVD in the form of the Criterion Collection. Both are sought after by collectors. The Criterion version came in the approved aspect ratio of 166 to 1, and also the director's cut was included, which had roughly an extra minute's worth of violence, which occurs during the opening board meeting with Ed 209, and Murphy's eventual death. When the movie got remastered for DVD a few years later, it came out with an adjusted ratio of 185 to 1. Many hardcore fans complained of the changes made, feeling it wasn't the correct ratio. I worked as a projectionist for a number of years, and I'm guessing a lot of theatres at the time probably played the movie in that ratio, down to many projectors only having two aspect ratios available, being 185 to 1 and 2351 for cinema scope features. It didn't particularly bother me, but I wasn't happy with the new 5.1 Dolby mix. A lot of Basil Podoros' score is drowned out by the sound effects. A perfect example is the shootout at the drugs factory. If you go back and listen to the original PCM Dolby Surround mix on the Criterion release, it sounds far superior. Even the recent Blu-ray release, which does have a great picture, thanks to its 4K remaster, it still has issues with its 5.1 Dolby mix. Robocop was the first major Hollywood production for director Paul Verhoeven. Paul rose to critical acclaim for his work on the Dutch film Soldier of Orange in 1977. He had directed his first English language film in 1985, called Flesh and Blood, but Robocop was the first to get wide release, especially in the United States. The Robocop script written by Edward Neumeyer and Michael Miner had been turned down by many directors in Hollywood, and many probably never read it once they looked at the title. Many studios weren't interested either, but thankfully Orion Pictures took a keen interest. Orion had great success with the Terminator a couple of years earlier, and were obviously looking for something similar to capitalise on its success. Even the original theatrical trailer for Robocop features the music from the Terminator. Paul had been handed the script, but discarded it without properly reading it, and thought it was just another silly movie. But thankfully his wife read it and told him there was more substance to the plot 
than he had originally thought, all having a degree in Biblical Studies, plus a double major in Mathematics and Physics, saw the religious side of the movie, with Murphy being a modern American Jesus, being gunned down and resurrected and then walking on water at the end. It's the film's strong emotional core and themes that interested Paul. With the story set in Detroit, they decided to shoot in Dallas, down to its great futuristic buildings, such as the Dallas City Hall, which was extended in height with a matte painting. Many of the urban settings were filmed in downtown Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania, shot during the hot summer of 1986, causing a lot of stress and friction between the crew. In the movie's early stages, they had considered actors like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Michael Ironside, and even Rutger Hauer to play the lead role of Murphy, but for an actor to fit in the eventual Robocop suit, they needed someone with a slim physique. In steps Peter Weller, who had recently starred in Buckaroo Banzai, which has now become a bit of a cult classic. Peter brought on mime artist Moni Yakim to help him with the robotic movements, but once Peter got into the suit for the first time, which took nearly 10 hours, he could barely move how he wanted, so they had to slow everything down he spent weeks practicing, which actually helped him a lot to define the style needed to bring across the robotic movements. In the near future, Detroit, Michigan is on the verge of collapse and is being overrun by crime. To escape this problem, the city mayor has signed a deal with OCP, allowing them to run the underfunded police department in exchange for allowing OCP to demolish the rundown sections of Detroit and construct a high-end utopia called Delta City, to be managed by OCP as an independent city-state. This move angers the police officers as they are now tied to OCP, and they threaten to strike. But OCP evaluates other options for law enforcement, and the senior president, Dick Jones, offers the ED-209 enforcement droid. But when it kills a board member during a demonstration, the OCP chairman is deeply disappointed and decides to go with the experimental cyborg design program called Robocop, as suggested by the young Bob Morton. A recently deceased officer is needed for the Robocop prototype, so OCP reassigns police officers to more crime-ridden districts, expecting officers to be killed in the line of duty. One such officer is Alex J. Murphy, who has just transferred in from Metro South. He has teamed up with Anne Lewis. On their first patrol, they chase down a gang led by the ruthless Clarence Bodiger, following them to an abandoned steel mill. When Murphy and Lewis call for backup but get no response, they head in and get separated. Murphy is brutally gunned down by Bodiger and his gang. In transit to the emergency room, he is pronounced dead. And as he passes away, you see the important memories in his life flash in front of his eyes that become to haunt him later on when he's resurrected as Robocop. Once Robocop is taken to the police department, he has to state his three primary directives. Number one, serve the public trust. Number two, protect the innocent. And number three, uphold the law. But the scientists are unaware of the fourth directive in Robocop's programming, which is classified. Robocop efficiently cleans Detroit of crime, and Morton is given lavish praise for his success, infuriating Jones. However, Morton's ambitions are cut short when Bodiger, under the employment of Jones, assassinates him. Meanwhile, Lewis finds out Robocop displays curious mannerisms that Murphy himself once displayed, and realises that Robocop is in fact Murphy. Robocop himself experiences past events from Murphy's life during his dreams, and once Lewis jogs his memory, he finds out the information needed in the police database, and returns to his former home, finding his wife and son had long since moved away. While he is there, more of his memories return. Robocop manages to track Bodica to a cocaine factory after his colleague spills the beans. Robocop shoots up the place, taking out all the thugs and corners Bodica, threatening to kill him. But Bodica admits his affiliation with Jones and reminds Robocop that he is a cop, triggering Directive 3. Robocop finds he cannot kill Bodica and instead takes him downtown to the station. He then approaches Jones at OCP headquarters and attempts to make an arrest but Jones reveals the fourth directive that prevents Robocop from taking any action against an OCP executive, which causes Robocop to shut down. To make matters worse, Jones unleashes Ed 209. Robocop has a great mix of video effects for his POV shots, beautiful matte paintings and Phil Tippett's great stop motion work. For a movie with a relatively small budget, the matte paintings really help create a bigger world. The effects plates are so detailed you wouldn't know if they were paintings unless someone pointed them out to you. It's a great achievement. Phil Tibbetts' animation on the scary Ed 209 is very fluid and creative. It's something about stop motion that gives an extra level of creepiness to Ed 209. I was certainly intimidated by him when he first showed up. 
The droid looks proper mean and his voice has that aggressive tone to it. Phil adds nice moments of humour to the character when he slips down the stairs and starts crying because he can't get back up. And at the end when Robo shoots the 209 on guard and it collapses and you can see its foot twitch, it's so little touches that add an extra bit of character to the robot. Even though Ed 209 doesn't have much screen time, he has become one of the most iconic robots in movie history, very much like Robocop himself. Rob Bottin produces some of his best work to date. The incredible design of Robocop which quite frankly looks fantastic today. The makeup effects on Murphy when he is gunned down, the melted thug near the end and of course when Robocop removes his helmet, the detail is just crazy. It looks real, I'm shocked the movie didn't win an Academy Award. The one thing that did bug me and probably other Robocop fans is what happens to the chin plate and the black rubber design around his neck when he removes his helmet. I think the only weak shot is the death of Dick Jones. When he flies out the window, they have a miniature replacing him and his arms look way too long. It's maybe down to how it's angled and shot, but it doesn't look right. Basil Pardoris composes the incredible score to Robocop, combining heavy orchestral percussion and electronic synth compositions. Once the movie starts, the music instantly grabs your attention. The score never shies away and is always in full force. Basil manages to create an awesome theme tune for Robo, which is recognisable and very memorable. The theme is easy to remember and will be stuck in your head after you've watched it. Also we have the emotional and very moving theme for Murphy's memories, which shows up when he returns to his old home and finds it empty after his wife and child have moved on. No electronic music, just a beautiful orchestral score tugging at your heartstrings. The soundtrack is one of my favourites and probably this and Conan the Barbarian are Basil's best pieces of work. The soundtrack has been issued a number of times over the years. It got released a year or two ago in complete form, but sold out very quickly. So if you want a complete copy, you may have to pay a lot for it on eBay. For many kids, Robocop the Arcade and the conversions to the 8-bit computers was their first introduction to the character. Data East produced the extremely popular arcade that was a basic scrolling shooter where you play as Robo, shooting people from rooftops and as they run towards you. It was very addictive, had great graphics and sound that was very hard. Well, for me anyway. It was designed to eat up your quarters or 20p's. Later on during the game it takes a few liberties with the license, with strange characters but apart from that it's a great translation of the movie. Ocean Software tackled the home conversions, which played like the arcade but were actually more faithful to the film, including extra levels such as matching up the faces and shooting the guy who's attempting to rape the woman. It's a shame you can't shoot him in the balls though. They did ports on the Spectrum, Amstrad, Commodore 64, Atari ST and Amiga. The Atari ST and Amiga ones obviously had the best graphics and looked closer to the arcade. The Spectrum port sold extremely well and was at the number one spot for months and some fans highlight it as the best version to get despite its weaker graphics. I had the Commodore 64 version which I loved as a kid but I could never get past the drug factory level. I always run out of time. I later found out there was a bug in the game and you could never complete the level. Naughty Ocean Software not testing their games properly. I also enjoyed playing the NES version, it had nice graphics for the time and was close to the other 8-bit versions and it also included some nice cutscenes between the levels. Robocop did seem to strut as he walked which always made me laugh. Just like the arcade it takes many liberties again with the characters and level designs that don't seem to follow the movie. I saw Robocop as a kid like many of my friends. It's one of those movies your parents wouldn't let you watch because of its rating and if they had seen it all the way through they definitely wouldn't have let you watch it my father especially. It's one of those flicks you had to watch around a friend's. My older sister loved the film and picked it up on VHS. I watched it one morning before going to school and the death of Murphy totally shocked me as you would expect. It's an incredibly disturbing scene and is helped a lot by Peter Weller's incredible performance. He's such a gifted actor and highly underrated. After seeing his death I was freaked out and turned it off before I headed out to school but I plucked up the courage and watched it again when I got home. When he becomes Robocop, the dark gritty nature changes to an exciting comic book sci-fi fantasy movie and it never misses a beat. The humour in the film is top notch, even when it's being gory and over the top with its violence, it always makes me laugh. It's a skill Paul Verhoeven has in combining humour with extreme violence. The violence never becomes the main focus of the film because its themes and clever use of satire raise it above that level of just being considered some mindless action flick. It has some great lines of dialogue and one-liners, such as I'd buy that for a dollar, bitches leave, dead or alive you're coming with me, and stay out of trouble. The script excels in its satire, 
taking cues from the economic climate at the time and capitalist social issues, which makes its theme still relevant today, helping this film stand the test of time. The casting is truly memorable and great to watch. Kurtwood Smith is extremely intimidating as Clarence. His character didn't need to be strong and tough. You can clearly see in his eyes he's a psycho, and when you see his previous crimes on the database, you know he is pure evil. The other members of the gang are brilliant. They do provide some great humor to the film especially Leon and Joe. Joe easily has the best laugh. <laughs> Nancy Allen as Lewis is a great partner to Murphy. There is chemistry between them as soon as they meet. It's great to see she is not played to be some throwaway love interest and comes across as a tough independent woman that helps Murphy remember his true self and remains loyal to him as a friend to the end. The movie is so tightly made thanks to its really efficient editing and pacing. The script is so perfect, it covers everything, so you don't end up feeling confused afterwards, like you've missed something or left wanting more. The film never feels sluggish in its execution. The final action set piece doesn't let up. You've got Robo taking out the gang, one guy gets covered in acid, another chase ensues, Clarence smashes into the melted guy, crashes his car, then takes out Lewis, leaving her heavily wounded. Robocop then attempts to kill Clarence but gets crushed by tons of scrap metal, leaving you shocked and on the edge of your seat. And then suddenly Lewis takes out Leon. Clarence stabs Murphy in the chest but Robo fights back and stabs him in the neck to finish him off. But it doesn't end there, oh no, and in just a few minutes he heads to OCP, blasts the on guard Ed 209 to bits, then finally taking out Dick Jones and being asked what his name is by the old man. He replies, Murphy. It makes you want to applaud and puts a big smile on your face. During the course of the film and what I love and what is the main heart of the story is the subtle moments of him turning human. When he gets attacked by Ed 209 you can see his eye through the damaged visor. You get a great sense of his vulnerability and seeing him getting shot at by the police and watching him struggle to walk is very moving and powerful imagery. Throughout the movie he has that robotic tone to his voice. When he removes his helmet it softens. By the end when he approaches the OCP management his original voice is very much in full swing. Due to the film's success, sequels were inevitable. Robocop 2 maintained that high level of violence but really lacked the charm and clever satire of the first and left many fans disappointed. But I still think the movie is a lot of fun, especially the face-off between Robocop and Kane. Robocop 3 was the prime example of studios trying to aim the series at kids and teenagers and it failed miserably. Not entirely because of its rating but because of weak direction and the boring script. Then came the live action TV series starring Richard Eden as Robo. The original writers wrote the first two episodes and it does try to capture the original style of the first movie, but ultimately fails down to its watered down approach, being aimed again at a younger audience. Robocop wouldn't kill anyone thus making it a total joke to fans of the original. I saw a few episodes when it first aired and I lost interest in it very quickly. I'm a big fan of Robocop and would happily watch a sequel, but deep down you know the first movie didn't need one. It's tough to know where else to go with the character, and you just end up with him fighting more bad guys or slugging it out against another machine, which is what happened with the sequels. Since the first movie, there hasn't been anything remotely as successful on a critical and financial level. But the Robocop fanbase still remains strong, despite the franchise being butchered by subpar sequels and spin-offs. When the remake was announced, Robocop fans went crazy. This was the one film they didn't want to see remade. Once the suit was shown and it looked bland and black and had his hand exposed and the PG-13 rating was announced, things did not look good and made fans worry even more. The trailers certainly failed to impress. If you want to know more about my opinion on the remake, you can find my review on my YouTube channel. I've reviewed so many films and a lot from the 80s. There are a few films which I consider very special to me such as Superman the movie and Ghostbusters, Robocop certainly is one of them. It does everything right, it's so rewatchable. The themes and messages throughout its multi-layered script will never date. I will never get bored of it. It is the best film from the 80s. Don't you have a name? Murphy, it's you. You really don't remember me, do you?
Murphy had a wife and son. What happened to them? Well, after the funeral, she moved away. Where did they go? She thought you were dead. She started over again. I can feel them. But I can't remember them. Clarence Bodiger, you are under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Fuck you. I had to kill Bob Morton because he made a mistake. Now it's time to erase that mistake. Looking for me?